Uh, well, welcome all. Um, I'd like you to introduce you to uh, Jack Reed from Stanford, who's uh, jumped in and uh, offered to do a guest presentation on IIIF and AI, uh, kind of focusing on the highlights of uh, what's going on and what's new in the IIIF community. So thanks, Jack, and over to you. Yeah, uh, let me share my screen here. Great, can you see my screen? And um, Glenn, do the attendees have the link to this already? Uh, I can share it in the chat. Yeah, um, let me. I'll, I'll put it in the chat right now. Great. Um, I, I'm Jack Reed. I'm a software engineer, and I work at uh, Stanford uh, Libraries. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about IIIF and machine learning. And this workshop um, is really one that I gave in December at the Fantastic Futures uh, Conference uh, in Sanford. And um, at, by this time in the workshop, we had kind of done a quick overview of what IIIF is. Uh, we had talked about the image API and the presentation API, and we had started to talk about annotations. Glenn, uh, wh where are y'all at kind of with the, with the uh, uh, workshop so far? Have you covered some of that stuff? So we, we covered the basics yesterday. Um, we're uh -huh. about to do the image API uh, in the next session, um, okay. presentation tomorrow, and annotations on Thursday. Okay. So well, this will, around, this will maybe be a good teaser for kind of um, as some of the uh, stuff comes up and uh, we can just kind of maybe see what's possible and talk about how these things can work together. Um, so, um, you know, we, we, we've been talking about IIIF and, and I'm just, I'm going to wildly assume a lot of things. So please correct me if I'm wrong about what's been taught already. And, and also, uh, please feel free to unmute, ask questions. Um, if I use um, terminology that uh, maybe uh, isn't understood, feel free to let me know. And um, we have plenty of time to talk about it and get all your questions answered. So um, we in, in this workshop, we kind of looked at um, a, some IIIF applications um, already um, and kind of how they how they can exist in different um, different places and and I'm sure a lot of this content is very similar to what Glenn is and, and the others have been going over um, and you know this is public and online you can always revisit it but there's a lot of opportunity to um, utilize IIIF uh, content in new types of contexts. Um, often we see IIIF content used in a viewer, so maybe like a cultural heritage web page, um, and you can view the object. Um, and that's great. Um, but because it, you know, because it uses underlying um, uh, these underlying specifications uh, that are common, there's a lot of flexibility to use IIIF content in other applications. Um, so one example is a lot of commercial entities provide uh, machine learning and AI services. And, um, you know, that's, that's a complicated kind of thing unto itself, but um, you know you can use IIIF content because it's available and uh, usable from um, st in standard ways. You can use IIIF content to uh, utilize it. So uh, we can tr kind of all try this maybe in our uh, own browsers. Um, I'm on sending IIIF images to commercial me machine learning uh, services. And um, and I apologize if there's chainsaw noise. We've had lots of storms and trees go down everywhere. So um, I apologize if there's extra noise. But you can click on this link here. And I've opened it in a new tab. And this is Microsoft's uh, computer vision uh, service. And you know their promise is you can extract rich information from images. 
Um, you know, and there's lots of promises and marketing uh, stuff on this website. Um, and they kind of give you an example of this blurred train image and you can see, oh, this is a, you hover over this, this is a subway train, this is a person, this is a person. And so, you know, you could, uh, this is an image that was used earlier in the workshop. And if you copy that URL and you just paste it into your browser, you can just see it's just a, it's a regular image, um, you know, and it's, it's a triple IF, uh, it's an image surf from the triple IF image API. And if you copy that image URL, and so the Microsoft's kind of system doesn't work right all the time, but if you copy it in here and paste it in there and click submit, see, sometimes it says we're unable to pull an image from the specified URL, please try again. So sometimes it doesn't work, um, like this time exactly during the demo. But what you can do is like, you can uh, right click and save the image to your computer maybe. And then once you have it like saved to your computer, like in the downloads or desktop folder, then you can click browse here and then upload it. And you'll see it uh, uploaded into this window here. It's the same image that we had here from a IIIF image API service. And you can see it's identified a bunch of different objects in this. So you can see person, 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 person. And then we have this blue square, gender, male, age 17. And, um, you know, there's some additional tags that maybe, and I think these are kind of like keywords maybe, um, that uh, it's identified to like person, outdoor, clothing, uh, human face, uh, black and white comp, uh, group. And, and there's also a confidence score here. I think this is zero to one, one being the most confident. So it's very confident that we can tag this as person, but it's a lot less confident to tag this as crowd. Um, you can also see like description tags that it automatically finds. Um, uh, posing, holding, woman, young, front, black, man, street, white, crowd, old, game, girl, walking, school. And then like, it kind of gives you a caption, a group of people standing in front of a crowd posing for the camera. Now that's an interesting description, I'd say. Um, there's also other things that it'll do. It'll kind of give an adult content score. Um, you know, uh, it'll, determine if this image is racy um, and it'll kind of auto categorize it. Um, so um, I'm hoping that this can be uh, interactive because I'm going to ask some questions and I hope you're, uh, I hope you uh, are interested to participate here, but we've, we've kind of looked and seen what we, we've taken an image from a triple IF image service. We've given it to a commercial, commercial uh, vendor uh, to do their AI on it. And, um, you know, I wanna hear about, uh, did anybody else find any interesting results kind of in there? Feel free to unmute yourself or, I don't know if you have a protocol for participating on this, but I wanna hear from you. Why is it to read? So we need just a little, a few, a few moments to do it ourselves. Please, yeah, let's take a few moments to do it. Great.
Um, sorry, thanks so much. I've been talking. <laughs> um, uh, Raphael asks, what are the good and not so good stories of GLAM institutions using computer vision tools like Azure's? Are there worries about insensitive labels, cloud costs, or successful stories? I think that's a great question. And part of us, uh, part of this workshop is for us to maybe uh, uh, have a discussion to talk about that. Um, can anybody see uh, any problems, ethical problems, uh, with using the service and using the descriptions and tags that maybe it provides back to us? Okay. Uh, Jen Johnson says algorithm bias. Uh, yes, most definitely. Um, you know, this algorithm is trained for a specific reason, given training data created by humans, and there's inherent bias in that. Uh, Allison says, I can see potential to generate quick and dirty image metadata, but you would want to get each tag confirmed by crowdsourcing. Yeah, that's a great point, too. Uh, we can quickly create some uh, metadata with these, uh, which is which can be useful. But yeah, we would also maybe want a second set of eyes on this for sure. Um, and to go back to Raphael's uh, point, I think um, I think it's uh, complicated um, about are there good stories of GLAM institutions using computer vision tools like Azure's? I think. Um, Oftentimes, uh, at least uh, libraries, and, and I, I'm only speaking to libraries because I work in a library, um, uh, have a commitment to uh, 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 privacy often. And so making sure that um, commercial services um, maybe aren't reusing our data in an unethical way. Um, or a way that we're uh, not interested, we're, we're um, we don't want them to use it. Uh, there's also, you know, th this is using a pre-trained model from Microsoft. Um, you know, there's also cloud services that allow you to create your own models or train your own models. And so maybe you have a more uh, tuned model to your type of content or that's more uh, focused on uh, your content. And that might be a way to uh, utilize the compute infrastructure of a cloud service while at the, or a commercial service, while at the same time um, uh, looking at or, or trying to focus on algorithmic bias uh, to better generate results. I'm going to uh, put the, the additional image that I shared in the chat here and submit that as well. And so we can see here, maybe this is a less, maybe less controversial. Um, the, the dis description is a painting of a man. Now that's pretty generic, but that's, you know, that's effectively correct. I don't know why birds are in here, maybe the coloring um, or the brushstroke pattern, but birds are also identified in some way. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pop over to the chat to the questions. I'm curious about the training sets. Could we use cultural heritage image collections as training sets to counter some of the problems with commercially available services? Uh, yes, most definitely. Um, and, and there's a lot of different um, uh, models. There's different uh, machine learning and AI models uh, that can be adaptive, uh, adapted to um, more effectively um, you know, maybe train for certain types of content. Um, and, and I think maybe uh, the kind of uh, examples, uh, the kind of next examples I'm going to go to are going to speak to that specifically. I would say, you know, if I don't, I, I would say th there's opportunities to deliver um, AI and machine learning applications that are general. Like, so this is a really general use case that I can insert any image and get some type of description tag or something like that. Um, now that now that can be great, but it may not actually give me a whole lot of um, you know a whole lot of uh, uh, 
more useful information beyond these kind of general tags. And those general tags may be problematic, like we maybe saw with the first photograph there. Um, I looked into Azure as a potential way to auto-generate alt text for digitized content we can share in our repository. The results were not good enough, though. Also found that color images worked better than black and white image. That's that's a great uh, point. Uh, you know, and and I I know a lot of uh, several organizations in the IIIF community have done um, comparisons between different cloud providers. So Azure, um, Google Cloud Vision is another product, and then um, uh, there's other as well that's been that's been tested. So I, I think maybe. I guess maybe one point of this I'd like to reinforce is that we have some information that can be useful, like maybe drawing, maybe sketch, that's useful, but we're also getting things like child art. And I think this is a Van Gogh. So, and that child art is also at a confidence of 88%. So it's, it's not all, you know, these kind of broad stroke general use tools are not always a great fit to think about. Um, um, you just need to be conscious of the potential problems with this um, by, you know, maybe using this as a way to just generate metadata for your content. It, it could work, but you may want to have a human also uh, review it. Uh, these are great, great questions. Um, Uh, maybe the children who drew the painting in the training sets are very talented. That's true. I, I agree. Um, you know, or maybe it's a forgery. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th this kind of broad, broad level tool uh, can be useful, but there's, there's problems, you know, there can be problems with it. And you just need to be, I think, uh, cognizant of those problems. I'm going to go on to the next page. Uh, what, one thing that we saw um, from the um, results from the computer vision um, was they can return uh, what we would kind of maybe t consider in IIIF uh, an annotation about the image. So this annotation response format is unique to the Microsoft service. And what it provides me is it gives me a way to say, hey, in this rectangle with these coordinates, I found a person and I'm 63% confident about that. And so it gives me this way to, uh, you know, talk about um, where the people are, where the objects are in this, um, in this uh, object here. So in, in as you work with other machine learning cloud providers, you'll find that they also have their own custom responses. And so there's also, um, so Google has a different response uh, in their cloud vision products. And the other, the other soft commercial providers also have uh, different responses. And, and what this means is, um, this type of information is kind of unique to each cloud provider. Uh, there's also uh, someone in the comments there brought up uh, training sets. And training sets are used as kind of a input to a machine learning or AI algorithm to build a model. And um, we, uh, it was also mentioned that there may be bias uh, kind of within these training sets. And there's going to be bias. There's going to be bias in almost any training set because they're generated by humans, uh, oftentimes, and humans humans have inherent bias. Um, so these training data also have unique formats. So there's kind of several formats that are used uh, in the machine learning AI communities, but they're all kind of different. But they all kind of Kind of all similar. So the uh, Coco format is this JSON format um, that kind of gives you an image ID, uh, bounding box to kind of select an area. The Pascal VOC format. Uh, this is used in a um, 
in a well-known model called ImageNet to um, denote annotations about um, areas and certain images. Um, the Open Images dataset, they, they just use a CSV file and the CSV has a lot of the similar image information here. So like uh, where the image is and then like bounding coordinates of a, a label for that, uh, for a part of that image. So, um, you know, I have a question here, compare and contrast these formats with open annotation and web annotation. And I don't think y'all have gotten there yet in the workshop, but I think it's maybe important to note that there's a lot of different ways to communicate um, uh, information about a certain part of a, an image. And one really powerful use of IIIF in the machine learning and kind of uh, AI uh, sphere is the ability to uh, do that in a standardized way. Uh, any questions about that? Okay. I'm going to move on. So I'm going to talk about two case studies here. And these case studies will kind of look at uh, two really specific use cases how uh, IIIF was used and kind of the goals uh, that they're after. So the first case study is a project called Histonuts. And um, this was really a project uh, used with a very specific, uh, with a very specific goal. Um, a um, political science uh, researcher wanted to look at how road network uh, road networks changed uh, over the course of the last century in the United States, and to do this, they wanted to be able to have to understand uh, what the road networks looked like over a large scale area like the United States over a hundred year period, and so that was going to take a lot of person hours to manually digitize not only the images, but then painstakingly trying to get every kind of feature of the road atlas. And so this, what this, uh, what this project uh, did was it aimed to use um, machine learning and IIIF to uh, build a platform for extracting this road network data. Uh, this project is probably four or five years old now, so it's kind of old. And I helped work on it in some ways. And, and I guess, um, you know, uh, I think there's a presentation on it here, linked here, if you want to kind of learn more about it. Um, we were kind of mildly successful, I think, in this. Uh, there, there's kind of a video here or a GIF of uh, some of the feature extraction, kind of the tooling we built uh, for people to uh, do feature extraction. Um, from the maps. Uh, people were able to do uh, turn maps and turn the road networks into kind of vectorized data that, didn't, that they were then able to analyze. Now that was, um, now that was kind of useful. Um, you know, one, I think one thing to note about this project that made it, um, that made it, uh, uh, maybe novel to uh, discuss in the IIIF realm is it used IIIF as part of the tooling to uh, import images and also export and provide annotations out. Um, another thing maybe to note is that this is a really specialized use case. So this project was developed specifically for this use case. And while we found the tools somewhat generalizable uh, to other use cases, it wasn't something like um, Microsoft Computer Vision where you could just import any image and get things off of it. Uh, we were able to generalize the tools to other types of template matching in images or and do things like counting, um, you know, counting similar shapes in, the, in images. Uh, 
So, um, you know, it, it was an interesting kind of use case and a good project, but, um, you know, I don't think as, uh, I think today would be maybe approached a different way than it was uh, four, four years ago. Uh, the technology just has advanced so rapidly. Any questions about uh, Histonets? All right, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, case study here. Is there anybody from Japan on the, on the, in the workshop today? No, unfortunately not, I don't think. No, okay. Well, uh, I think one really exciting project to share with you um, is a project called Coronet. And, um, you know, this is a really, uh, really kind of uh, interesting project that's taken a lot of facets. Um, and, and what it does, it, kind of, well, kind of background on the project is there's this uh, uh, kind of an ancient writing style, cursive writing style that was used in Japan, um, you know, and it's thousands of years old. And, um, I'm sorry, over a thousand years old. And there's millions of books in this content. Um, but I think in the night, like at, at the turn of the century, they started removing it from Japanese curriculum. And so the kind of result uh, has been that um, uh, the Japanese uh, people who live in Japan now cannot really read books. And so uh, read books written in this cursive style. And so, you know, there's millions of these books, but they're kind of unreadable by the mass of the population. And um, this project um, is really multifaceted, kind of focused on um, building tools using triple IF that would allow um, uh, people to kind of translate or, or transcribe um, this text, this ancient text into um, uh, uh, modern uh, Japanese. So um, they took several different approaches here, um, but I'll kind of show is they have this uh, application now that allows you to add any um, triple IF image service of, um, of Kazu Shiji, uh, uh, is the, is a script and what it'll do, it'll automatically kind of transcribe it, uh, on the page. Let me see if I have my account set up still. We need to log in. Nope. I'm in. Okay. So here's an example, and this is uh, this ancient text. And how do I do this? I forget now. <laughs> nope, that, ah, this thing. Okay, I think I do this. And so what this will do, I can, I selected an area of the image and then I can click on this to run it through the service. And um, I don't speak Japanese, but I think, so right now I think this is running through the service and it has not completed yet. Um, I think that's what this means is it's still in process here. I'm going to see if I can refresh the page and oh, it's still not done yet. Um, oh, there we go. Maybe it's running now. Okay. I had to click that thing. Um, and I guess it's done and maybe that will allow me to view it.
Okay. So here, this is, you know, this is my, um, you know, this is the trans transcription, I guess, of, of these into modern text. There's some tools here for changing the horizontal and vertical offsets, uh, the opacity and also the size. So the size might be a little bit uh, bigger to read. And, um, you know, this is great. So, I mean, one, one cool thing about this is there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of functionality in here and this is kind of all driven by triple IF. Um, uh, the image that's sent to the machine learning uh, model is a triple IF image of the area that I selected. Uh, one, you know, and so they've, also worked really hard to create a uh, great model uh, for this and also painstakingly created a lot of um, uh, training data for this. And so one, and, and there's actually a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different uh, articles written about this and papers, um, computer science papers written about this project. So I kind of let those um, those kind of speak for themselves, um, or you know, if you're interested, you can follow up more about those. But uh, one thing to note too is they also were able to create a Kegel competi uh, competition, and th this kind this is a platform that's used by data scientists and machine learning. Um, and AI um, uh, practitioners. And what this platform does is it kind of gives people cash prizes to create a, bet, a better model for them. And so they were actually able to spend $15,000 for prize money. And they, the winners who people just, you know, people on the internet who signed up to this competition actually achieved 95% accuracy on creating a model for them. So this was a kind of a great kind of public relations project, but also they were able to spend uh, money, $15,000 um, in prize money with really good training data to actually get a really good model created for them by the public. And um, the result of this also, um, on this platform is a lot of different code, uh, different ways that people have kind of set up um, how to um, how to work and model this data. And there's a lot of great artifacts for, from this project, just from uh, random people on the internet who've kind of uh, worked to help create a better model. So this is an example of um, you know triple IF content of millions of books in this ancient script that can be now run through this uh, machine learning algorithm created by this kind of uh, crowdsourced um, uh, competition. And now they have a really good model that they can use to, um, to transcribe, uh, transcribe this content, content. And I think this is one of the most exciting kind of uh, projects I've seen. It does public engagement it's a really well-defined use case. It, it uses triple IF and interoperability and, um, and they have a great result from it. Uh, I saw a question pop up. A very straightforward question. How could you know of existing projects in order to know if there is already a model that you could use or start with? Something like a library of projects. I'm working on Greek and Latin printed texts of the Renaissance, for example, and the Greek characters are specific to that period. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think there's a, uh, a couple places to look and check. Um, uh, first off, uh, maybe within different types of like scholarly communities, there might be specific scholars who are working on those types of examples. Um, so engaging with, um, with you know, maybe other scholars who, who are, work in that area might be a way to find that out. 
Also, um, there's, you know, there's community groups within the IIIF community. I know the, um, you know, the manuscript um, uh, community group has a lot of uh, people kind of working on uh, texts and different languages, and that might be a good uh, place uh, to start or engage with. Um, if you're on the IIIF Slack, I believe they have a Slack channel manuscripts. Um, you know, or, um, uh, and I know also of an emerging community called uh, AI for LAM, AI for Libraries, Archives, and mu Museums. Um, and those, uh, that community may have some uh, engagement. Oh, thanks, Allison. Allison posted uh, the public transcribist models um, um, available there. So thanks so much. Uh, so that was the CuroNet project. And, and this is a, you know, I, I mentioned uh, several different kind of facets of it, but it's a large project and uh, has, a, has had a lot of people working on it, but it's been, wow, it's been pretty successful. Um, any kind of questions about the CuroNet project? Um, or, um, you know, point observations that you'd like to make? This link in the transcribus bottles there. Oh, there's a lot of great ones there. Oh, also eScriptorium. Yeah, and I saw the presentation on eScriptorium last week during IIIF week. Thanks for mentioning that, Ben. And that was really cool to see. Um, so there, uh, I, I'd, I'd recommend maybe watching this video, uh, but you can kind of see they're using um, uh, machine learning to uh, help uh, transcribe. Uh, ancient texts, handwritten documents. So I think, um, oh, from Raphael, it's really cool. Do you see other promising applications in addition, in addition to OCR, like pattern recognition? Um, yeah, Raphael, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, uh, OCR is definitely one that um, is being used and, and continues to get great use. Um, another application, um, uh, the Norwegian National Library uh, has, has worked on, um, has been uh, like image simul similarity search. Um, um, and that's, that's pretty cool. We've also seen, uh, some, um, things like, uh, object detection. So, um, you could, you know, uh, train, train a algorithm to identify, you know, um, um, a certain statue or monument or something, and then you could, you know, enable users to find all the photos of that statue uh, or monument or building. Um, so, so those types of um, applications are um, also, um, you know, also have a lot of promise and usage. Um, you know, and also kind of, I think, I think I saw this in the eScriptorium demo last week, but um, we've also seen in kind of like, building uh, platforms for users to generate their own models, 
create their own models. So that's kind of, I think, probably something that we'll see um, also um, for kind of specific scholarly use cases. Oh, Ben posts another link there. Uh, the experiment recognizing decorated initials in manuscripts. Oh, very cool. So some feature extraction there. Oh, very cool, Ben. Oh, looks like here's all the, the kind of final data set. But we can see all the initials. It's awesome. Any, uh, anybody else have any other demos or things that they've seen that they want to share? Uh, there, there's way more than what, what we've talked about um, on this call, but you know, I know there's uh, uh, other people out here on the call with uh, IIIF experience, maybe some things that they've seen that are not to miss. Well, uh, any more uh, questions or uh, you know, thing, things that maybe you, you see an opportunity in kind of your area of study um, for machine learning um, and AI and maybe wondering how it might relate to IIIF? No. Well, okay. Well, that's all the content I had. Um, Glenn, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jack. That's, that's been really useful. Uh, it's great to see all these examples. Um, machine learning is one of the things that I'd love to spend more time learning, um, but thank you for sharing all that. Um, so the next session on the Image API is going to be in about uh, 10 minutes, so we can have a, a quick break uh, before we come back. So thanks all. Oh, oh, I so have another question, question come in. Yeah. You mentioned that IIIF can be used to standardize the format. Can you speak a bit more to that? Sure thing. Um, so um, a lot of uh, a lot of machine learning um, in AI applications, um, when you're building or training a model, um, you're usually um, sending through a lot of different images um, uh, to this model with uh, different information about these images. And sometimes it can be hard to collect and gather and then utilize all the, utilize those images. So one really nice benefit of the IIIF image API is you could uh, essentially download and cache all of those images that you want to use for training and building your model at the correct size and resolution that you need it for your model, kind of the optimal size. And, and the really useful piece about that is, um, you know, a, a lot of cultural heritage organizations may pride themselves on digitizing their um, manuscript at really high resolutions, which is great and all, but for some AI machine learning context, you may not want to put full resolution content through uh, when training your algorithm. It'll take a very long time and it won't actually give you better results. So uh, the image API enabling you to rescale your images um, is, is really useful um, and, and redo it multiple times if you need to. Uh, the second piece is uh, the kind of annotation format. 
when we build training data um, uh, for uh, machine learning applications, that's it's in usually it's in different formats and proprietary formats. So we're getting labels back from uh, Google Cloud Vision and Google's format. We're getting stuff back from Microsoft and Microsoft's format. Um, uh, standardizing this, these kind of exports into a common import um, is useful for reuse. Um, so you could um, enable your um, human generated uh, labels or, or tags for images in a uh, way that's compatible with IIIF so that they could be more easily reusable. Uh, rather than in this proprietary format at the given time given by Microsoft. So that's just kind of one way um, that those could be uh, standardized into something like a web annotation, W3C web annotation data format, and then, then that can be reused. Um, so that's kind of the promise of IIIF is interoperability uh, among your content and um, and, you know, I think there's really good reasons why specific uh, AI models or platforms do their own formats. Um, but, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's useful for uh, organizations like libraries to also make that content now interoperable um, the same way they're doing it with their images for IIIF. Uh, hope that answers your question there. All right, any other questions? All right, well, thanks so much for having me and um, uh, have fun the rest of your week in the IIIF workshop. Thanks, Jack. Cheers, all.